Brooklyn Independent Television. Hey, it's a big bar. Would Brooklyn really go for it? Why don't we just agree to disagree? Yeah, that's really going to fly in Well, that's a good question. No, 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 no. Listen. That's exactly the point I wanted to make. No community is immune to the horrors of childhood sexual abuse. Not even communities of faith. But what happens when criminal law and religious order collide? We've seen this play out in the Catholic Church, and now Brooklyn's Hasidic and ultra-Orthodox Jewish community is at the center of a wave of allegations and apparent cover-ups. I'm Brian Vines, and on this edition of Intersect, we present two conversations about childhood sexual abuse. With Ben Hirsch, the head of the advocacy organization Survivors for Justice, and Brooklyn District Attorney Charles Hines. Survivors for Justice, why does your organization need to exist? Um, the organization needs to exist because there is a serious problem within the ultra-Orthodox and Hasidic communities um, related to child sexual abuse. Um, in sum and substance, the problem is rabbinic cover-up. And the problem of rabbinic cover-up of this issue has resulted in a problem that um, is threatening the safety of children in the community and outside the community. Um, initially in 2005, late 2005, early 2006, a small group of people within the community, myself included, um, got together to deal with one notorious child molester who was working in a local yeshiva. And, and yeshiva is a place where young people, it's a school. It's a school, and this particular yeshiva, it's a, yeshiva is a uh, religious school, a uh, Jewish um, religious school. This particular yeshiva was rather large, it's a thousand students, mm -hmm. kindergarten through post high school. And the particular child molester that we were focused on was someone who had been teaching there for 40 years. Oh. Um, it was more or less an open secret in the community that this man was was an offender. And he was protected throughout. Anytime allegations were made, there would be a backlash to the victim, to the families. Um, I was drawn into this by a friend of mine who had been abused by this teacher. Mm -hmm. When he stepped forward as a teenager, he was crushed. Mm -hmm. And he tried dealing with it, he tried getting people involved, and the dean of the yeshiva came down on him, used whatever um, connections he had to intimidate my friend, to intimidate his family. And in 2005, this friend told me the story. And what struck me was the cover-up and the intimidation. Mm -hmm. And we decided we're going to try to do something about this. And we reached a point early on where we decided media is the only answer. Uh, that we're going to have to break the taboo of not bringing these issues to the limelight because it was the only thing that was going to um, pressure the powers that be within the community to do something about it. Can you explain uh, what halakha is in relation to this whole cover-up or taboo in reporting sex abuse? I would strongly divide the two. Um, taboo is going to be cultural. Um, communal um, sensitivities. Um, halakha is law, and law is written law, and then there's commentary on the law. Yeah. And um, the two unfortunately get confused, and you're pretty much hitting the nail on the head um, as to the, the root of the problem in the community. Because if the practice was to follow halakha, Jewish law, we would not have this problem. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the norms would be the same as elsewhere. These matters would be dealt with by, the, by law enforcement, by the secular authorities. Um, the problem is that there's a lot of confusion, and unfortunately it's intentional, um, about what is law, what is Jewish law, and what is you know, taboo and, and custom. So in, in a society, a democratic society, where the criminal justice system is balanced, um, a Jew is obligated to report the crimes to the secular authorities. That's law, and anybody who would say otherwise is distorting the law. Uh, Rabbi Kamenetsky, 
is a head of an organization who seems to be uh, opposed to your views on this reporting aspect. Rabbi Shmuel Kamenetsky is actually the second in command at uh, Agudath Israel of America, and his position is that you need to ask a rabbi permission before you can report child sexual abuse so to the authorities. When this man speaks, people listen. The leadership of this organization um, is comprised of count the Council of Torah Sages. Um, Torah is um, the Old Testament right. uh, Jewish law. Um, and they are the leading rabbis in North America. I mean, we, we compare them at times to the cardinals of the Vatican. We don't have a pope. Right. We don't have um, uh, Rome. But these are the most influential rabbis in North America and to some extent in the world. And the organization has taken an official position that one must uh, seek permission from a rabbi before reporting child sexual abuse to the authorities. And they've recently um, attached a proviso. And the exception is when um, the act is witnessed or if the person themselves has experienced the abuse, which is almost meaningless because, generally speaking, it's the child that right. uh, is being abused, and the child, a minor, is not going to go to the authorities without their parents, and the parents are not witnesses. And with the witness aspect, it's very rare that a crime of this nature is actually witnessed. And interestingly, speaking of halacha, mm -hmm. there are specific and black letter law written exclusions to the requirement that um, a crime be witnessed when it comes to crimes of this nature, when it comes to rape, when it comes to child abuse, where the nature of the crime is one, is such that the crime is generally not witnessed the rules of evidence are dramatically weakened and testimony from a child is accepted, etc. So, I mean, they're ignoring this and the statement that they're issuing is, runs counter to Allah and that's little me making this statement with confidence and emphatically and I'm making it in the face of the most influential group of sages representing the ultra-Orthodox community and what I'm telling you point blank, simply, they are misstating Jewish law. And they are not only misstating Jewish law, which let's say arguably they would have a right to take a position and say, hey, this is our interpretation. Right. But what they're doing that is really odd is they are misinterpreting a ruling by a elderly sage who lives in Jerusalem, Israel, um, who is respected. He's now, I believe, 101 years old. Mm -hmm universally respected and generally when he issues a ruling it's kind of hard to to it's the ruling it's the ruling right. and these rabbis accept that and these rabbis tell their followers and the community that you must respect this rabbi's ruling and his name is rabbi el yashiv and what they've done recently is they've taken his written ruling and they've turned it on its head we have a district attorney in Brooklyn who has been on the receiving end of some criticism about his office's handling of uh, the reporting and non-reporting issues in this community. What is he doing right and what could they do better? District Attorney Hines has stepped up to the plate in the past um, 10 days or so and he has made pronouncements that we've been waiting for for six years mm -hmm. and we're very encouraged. What he's done in the past week that he hadn't done before is he's actually addressing the statements by Good Israel of America, Rabbi David Zwiebel, who speaks on behalf of the Council of Torah Sages. Um, he's addressing their statements to the community that they should not go directly to the police, but rather ask permission of a rabbi first. And D.A. Hines is finally saying, can't do that. You've got to go to law enforcement. And if you obstruct, you're going to face criminal charges, and you, know, you may find yourselves in handcuffs. Now, we're thrilled to hear him say this. Right. And we're waiting to see something happen. Um, we're concerned. We're concerned that he may not be up to, and no criticism to him personally, there are real, realities involved here. He may not be up to um, paying the political price 
for arresting a big name rabbi who has the ability to sway 50,000 votes. Mm. And those are the rabbis that are engaging in the intimidation. So, so if, if, he, if he does not mm -hmm. follow through, it's going to be status quo. But if he actually finds the courage to do what he says he's going to do, he'll be a hero. I mean, he will change the world. Do you have a sense that the community is changing their way that they look at victims of this abuse and even survivors who've come forward? Because there seems to be a very distinct sort of bias on the part of don't be accused. By making an accusation, you can ruin someone's life. The um, argument that a false allegation can ruin a life, while on the face of it legitimate, yeah, of is, a red, is a red herring, um, especially in this community. Now, I'm not saying that there, is, there are not false allegations. There are false allegations. But generally speaking, the price that a victim pays for coming forward in this, in this community is so great that to suggest that people are willingly subjecting themselves to the intimidation, to the shunning, to the assault, to the families being shunned, to make a false allegation is to suggest that these people are insane, is to suggest that this person coming forward just has, has no, is out of touch with reality. Somebody coming forward and making an allegation is doing something that is incredibly courageous, um, dangerous, I'm not saying life-threatening, but dangerous to the future, dangerous to their future. It harms their family. So it's not a decision that's made lightly. Um, as far as the sea change, mm -hmm. when we first started in 2005 and 2006, the, the reaction within the community was, it's not true. Mm. We don't have a problem. Everyone else has a problem. Catholic Church has a problem. We don't have a problem. Every step forward, we noticed more and more people within the community changing their tune mm -hmm. from it's not true to maybe to, yeah, we know. I know somebody who's a victim. They know somebody who's a victim. There's a news blog called Vus is Nias, mm -hmm. and it's a Hasidic news blog. Um, the blog conglomerates news, and they have a comment section. When we first started, the comment sections in, in that paper were, I would say, 80 to 90 percent, how dare you? Yeah. You're slandering the community. And if you take a look at the comment sections now when they run abuse stories, it's, it's the polar opposite. 80, 90 percent of the comments are, this is a terrible problem, how come the rabbis are telling people not to go to the authorities, we have to do something about it? And those are the people speaking. And those are the people feeling comfortable speaking because most of them are anonymous. Right. So. Not so anonymous. We saw protests in the streets of Williamsburg recently when there was a benefit for a rabbi who is facing charges. And it was a fundraiser to pay for his defense. But there were people standing across the street from this catering facility saying, no, this is a bad guy. We shouldn't be supporting him. And it makes our community look bad. I mean, it's, it's inspiring to see that. And I just want to clarify one thing. I don't believe that they were saying this is a bad guy. We don't want to see you support him, although mm -hmm. some of them may have been saying that. Right. The way I understood the message, it was, don't go after the victim. We don't know whether this guy is innocent or guilty. Some of them do. Mm -hmm. I don't. And I believe that he has a right to defend himself. Right. But that fundraiser was not a fundraiser. That fundraiser was an exercise by the leadership of this community in sending a message to any victims who dare come forward. You come forward, you're going to be facing this type of humiliation, this type of intimidation. We're going to have thousands of people coming to show support of the accused. So think twice before you subject yourself, your family, your friends to this type of a reaction. Right. So the message was, don't do this. They don't need to do this to raise funds in that community. Mm. It's generally a poor community with several wealthy people. For this type of a thing, especially an embarrassing crime of this nature, Funds are raised quietly. They don't have a big to-do. They don't have a gathering and a catering hall. Right. This was a message, as were the posters. If you take a look at the posters, you see the missile landing right. a, on, on the community. The community yeah. I mean, the missile is the accusation, is the, the young woman who's making the accusation, and she's bringing the outside authorities into the community. And it's, it's you know, there's a lot of, of subtlety to an outsider, but to the people in that community, it's, it's straight clear. talk. Yes, it's clear. But it was really... Um, uh, 
it, it was encouraging to see, you know, a, after a few years, to see people stepping forward out in the limelight saying, no, this has to stop. And these, they're growing. These voices are growing and these people are, are um, getting together more and more. They're going to be getting together more and more and it, it, helps, it helps change. It helps change. The Daily News, there's an op-ed piece, the story in the Times last week. Right. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. Call Sadak is everywhere. So what have you guys done right and what would you have done better? I would probably have explained it better. I mean, because it's fundamentally easy to understand when you know that for 19 years we had virtually no cases in sex abuse in the ultra-Orthodox community because every time uh, the defendant's name became public, which is the way we ordinarily announce cases, there would be a relentless search for the victim. Mm -hmm. Remember, you have a very small insular community. Everybody knows everybody else. So if the abuse was uh, committed typically in a yeshiva school or or a synagogue, didn't take them long before they could identify. And when they identified, the intimidation and the harassment led to cases falling apart. Uh, and it was consistent. And over time, we tried, for example, to uh, induce a victim or the family member to wear a wire so we could confirm the threats. Well, you can understand, I guess, that if someone has been intimidated to the point of not pressing a sexual assault uh, charge, they would be less interested in helping us with intimidation. So that was the state of where we were. We then devised uh, the Voice of Justice, or Kol Sedek, uh, in partnership with Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty, with the OHEL Family Services, and with the Jewish Families and Children's Services, all very well-respected social service agencies. We decided after a number of meetings that we would not identify the names of the defendant. Now, that doesn't mean we embargoed those names. Those names are part of the public record in, in any court where the, where the charge is, is uh, filed. And every time a defendant has to appear in court, uh, his name is on the court calendar. Uh, if he's convicted of a sex crime, uh, he has to register. Just and like anyone else yeah, there. and anybody anybody who wanted to know who he is, you put in your zip code, and you'll get all the, the perverts coming up. Right. So, uh, as a result, when the Times began its story, uh, which was the end of a five year, five uh, month investigation. Uh, there was some inaccuracies. When the Times reporter, Ray Rivera, who's a good reporter, said to the head of our sex crimes division, Ronnie Jouse, you say it's on the public record. If I find a case, would you confirm? And she said, yeah. He was only able to find 47 cases. Now, there's a couple of curious things that come out of that. First of all, he concluded with not a shred of evidence that half the cases weren't Cole Sedeck cases. Just absolutely untrue, inaccurate. Secondly, he concluded there must have been an inflation of the numbers. Basis of what? I don't know. But what I find very, very curious is that um, he didn't reveal the names. I mean, he had an opportunity to reveal the names, and he didn't. Yeah. So maybe he thought that, that uh, we, had, we had a point. Um, Sue Edelman of The Post contacted us and said, I'd like to see the names. And she said, she was told, if you do it off the record, then you can come in, that's fine. And she came in and counted 96 names. Then Rivera called and said, can I get the same deal? And he said, sure, off the record. Same thing. Um, I didn't race out to the newsstand the next night, breathlessly looking for the times to correct the inaccuracy, because I know they don't do things like that. With respect to the news, the editor of the Daily News, the editor of the, the guy in charge of the editorial board, Arthur Brown, doesn't like me, and I don't like him either. Only I don't write editorials, so he's able to write, yes, this morning was the 50th editorial attacking me in 22 years as DA, and most of his editorials 
or vacuous or banal with no substance. So I guess overall the best thing I can talk about with this uh, uh, program is why isn't people seeing, why aren't people seeing that before we instituted the program, we had almost no cases. Since we instituted the program, we've had now, as of today, 99 cases. We have closed uh, 52 cases and we have a 73% conviction rate. So and how does, I'm sorry, how mm -hmm. does an organization like Aguda Israel who has their leaders saying, we'll keep this in our community, and if it rises to a level where the sort of rabbinical council that we convene says we should go and press criminal charges with the district attorney, how has that made your job and mission here more difficult? It's more difficult because, as I told David uh, Y. Bell, the head of Agudath uh, Israel, He's wrong to do that, wrong to recommend a, a rabbinical court or to have a rabbi review a sexual abuse uh, claim before turning it over to secular authorities for two reasons. One, they have no expertise. Mm -hmm. Number two, if they cross the line and suggest to someone they should not report to secular authorities sex abuse, they could be charged with obstruction. And worse than that, if they uh, intimidate or threaten in any way, it could be a much more serious charge. I had the same problem with the Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, which includes Brooklyn and Queens. And in 2002, the Bishop of Brooklyn, then Tom Daly, wisely decided to enter into a memorandum of understanding with me where there could be no pre-screening. Any charge of sexual abuse by a priest was immediately turned over to me. My uh, obligation was that within 10 working days, yeah. if I couldn't find any crime, I turned the whole file back. It's worked very well since 2002. Is there an arrangement like that coming for the ultra-Orthodox and Hasidic community? They don't have a hierarchical archaeal authority that like the church. Kind of, right. Yeah. So I, I, my option then is to I uh, introduced legislation, which I plan to send to the New York State DA's Association this week, um, and then on to the legislature, which would make the clergy in New York State mandatory reporters. There are 26 states in this country that require mandatory reporting by clergy. Mm -hmm. Two of them, <coughs> West Virginia and New Hampshire, have a clergy penitent privilege. 24 do not. So having a uh, clergy penitent privilege is what we have in New York State. So all I want to do is, is, um, is uh, amend the state rec uh, reporting requirements to include the clergy. And, and that would eliminate all of this stuff. I mean, and to make, we'll make it clear, yeah. if someone confesses to a member of the clergy, or to, that, that, that can't be revealed. But it's third party abuse right. that they'd have to report. So we've talked to you before mm -hmm. about all of the innovative programs yeah. or some of the innovative programs yeah. here in the office, bringing in social workers yeah. and all of the ways that you holistically look at crime mm -hmm. and right. crime victims. And the question sort of has come down to law and order versus the approach of bringing in convictions as well as yeah. changing people's lives who've been right. victimized. Yeah. So does this uh, program that specifically deals with a small segment of a small segment of the community of Brooklyn, is it sort of a double-edged sword with having a program like one specifically for Hasidim and ultra-Orthodox Jews? Why should they be separated from the larger perpetrators of childhood sexual because abuse? Because the larger perpetrators don't have the kind of chain mm -hmm. or they don't have the same, the same kind of organization within their, within their community to relentlessly find out the names of the victims and then terrorize the victims. It's, I've, I've compared it to the mafia, uh, and because you know, in mafia cases, I can, I can take someone and put them in witness protection. Right. I can't take someone from the Orthodox community and put them in some other place. They feel bound to that community. And the kind of intimidation they get is, is directly related to their need to stay in that community. Kids are thrown out of yeshiva school. They're denied the opportunity to go to summer camp. Uh, marriages can't be arranged. All of the things that are the indicia 
of the ultra-Orthodox are denied someone who, for the, <coughs> for the temerity to come forward and to uh, help prosecute a pervert uh, or ostracize. Yeah. So it's a much different community. And now, I had the option that a lot of DAs have. There aren't any DAs in this country who have this kind of intensive program. Mm -hmm. So I could have said, well, you know what? You, you, can't, you can't deal with this uh, community because they're too insular and you know, they'll, they'll thwart every effort. I can't do that. I know that there's sex abuse in the Orthodox community. And damn it, I have an obligation to make sure little children are protected, and that's what I'm going to do. Do you, does your office have any intention of bringing charges against a high-ranking rabbi who is someone who is essentially conspiring to not bring these charges? If, if any rabbi of whatever rank mm -hmm. uh, uh, counsels someone not to go to secular authorities, and I can prove that by, by other means you know, to, to corroborate it, uh, I will prosecute them for the misdemeanor of obstruction. If they go further and they threaten, then there are felonies I can charge them with. I have set up a task force, law enforcement task force, the sole goal of which is to put someone in handcuffs that would engage in that kind of criminal thuggery. And that's what they are. Someone who threatens someone, someone who intimidates someone uh, uh, to, to uh, protect uh, a, uh, a pervert uh, at the expense of a child who's been molested. They are thugs, and I will prosecute them and put them in jail if I can. If you have been the victim of abuse, visit these websites for resources and information. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.